Hello there, welcome back. Well, it's now a couple of days later. Apologies for not getting my fuller Power of the Doctor review up on the Monday as I'd anticipated. I had a couple of things on uh, Monday afternoon, which took a little bit longer than I thought. By the time I get back, I didn't have really much time to uh, sit and get my thoughts on camera. Then yesterday, I had an unexpected day of work. Um, by the time I got home from that, I was exhausted. So it's now Wednesday morning, and I'm going to sit and talk about Doctor Who. And I think it's probably just as well that I've been slightly delayed, but the world of Doctor Who moves very quickly. And there's been some quite big new news um, announced yesterday, Tuesday, which I think is going to have a fundamental effect on the future of Doctor Who going forward. And it's potentially very, very exciting. I'll talk about that first before I talk about the episode. Of course, it was the announcement via Shuti Gatwa, the new Doctor, uh, I'll talk about him again in a moment. Um, the Doctor Who, as of presumably the next specials and the next series, is going to be streaming exclusively worldwide on Disney+. Plus. In the UK uh, and Northern Ireland, it's still going to be on BBC One. That's its, its home, which I think is as it should be. That's where it started. That's its natural home in this country. But the prospect of Doctor Who being on Disney+, Plus is very, very exciting. Disney+, Plus, as you may know, has had uh, an enormous success over the last year or so, a couple of years since it launched. Um, it has uh, become one of the dominant streaming services, thanks to its Star Wars and Marvel content, and of course its backlog, rich heritage backlog of Disney titles. And it's become a very attractive proposition for people as their go-to streaming service now, people like Netflix for its original content, Amazon for its original content. Disney's got all that, plus, as I say, a, a really beloved back catalogue of titles, which is freely available, and they're getting new shows and new product right, left and centre. Disney Plus, if you haven't got it, it's recommended. I know a lot of people are very anti-Disney because of that corporate sort of machine mentality it seems to have, and it's steamrolling across the entertainment industry, but it's the 21st century. Um, it's the sort of thing that happens. And it's understandable that Disney would want to get Doctor Who because it is a recognised brand with a lot of untapped potential. Big as Doctor Who is, and it's, of course, a huge phenomenon and a national institution in the UK. And it's made inroads across the world. It's well known across the world. It's got a, a certain fan, fan base in America. But it's always been bubbling away, bubbling away. Uh, I think Paul McGann, when he made the TV movie back in 1996, he did a little documentary called... I think it was called Saying Adieu, which was Sylvester McCoy passing the baton on to Paul McGann. And Paul McGann <clears throat> saying that he felt Doctor Who was like a sleeping giant. It was this thing that had been asleep at the time for a few years, but was ready to burst free and become this big phenomenon. And that happened to an extent. When the show came back in 2005, it was a revelation to a lot of people. And was a huge hit and continues to be a big hit. Don't let people tell you otherwise because they don't understand the way ratings work. But that's another issue. But there's always been a feeling, especially now with with the rise of streaming services and these massive, massive franchise titles, uh, your Game of Thrones, the Thrones series, your Star Wars series, all these things are big international behemoths that are rolling across the world. Doctor Who now has the chance to become one of those. It's on, you know, people don't have to struggle in different countries to find it on streaming services, BBC America, or whatever Australian channels were showing it. Now it's going to be freely available on Disney Plus for everyone in the world, uh, which is incredible. And it, it it's slightly nerve-wracking because it exposes Doctor Who to, I suppose, a greater potential to underachieve if it doesn't bring in new subscribers, if it doesn't find a new fan base. You know, it, it's make or break in a way for Doctor Who, I think. This is its big chance to rule the world in the way that I think Russell T. Davis has always thought that it should, and I think most level-headed fans always thought it should um, and of course this has all happened under the stewardship of Russell T Davies I mean I have no idea what's going on behind the scenes I did know and I'd heard that there was some big financial thing coming along for Doctor Who because his budget is going to be I think massively increased for the new episodes which it will need to and it makes sense now it's on Disney Plus great as Doctor Who looks now and it looks fantastic now it's got to go up a couple of levels again to satisfy the visual and you know, immersive demands of an audience who are used to Star Wars. And, you know, you look at these shows, which are just feature films on the screen. And that is now how Doctor Who's got to be. So any Doctor Who fans of certain vintage who, I just want Doctor Who to be like it was in the 60s and 70s. It's never going to happen. It's never going to be a little low budget show made in Studio D 
D, Lime Grove or whatever. Those days are gone. Doctor Who is now a big international franchise. This is its chance to take on the world. Uh, and I can understand that this is probably one of the things that attracted Russell T Davis to come back. The thought of a lot of money being available, um, a massive streaming service like Disney Plus, this push to make Doctor Who what it should be. And I know he's said in the past about having lots of spin-offs because there's a lot of potential for Doctor Who universe. So I, you know, it's an, it's an exciting time. It could go either way. It could just not work. Doctor Who might not catch on. But I think the right people are there now. We've got Russell T. Davis back as the showrunner. We've got the Phil Collinson and Julie Gardner back as the producers, as they were back in 2005. And Jane Tranter, who was, I think, the head of BBC One at the time when Doctor Who was commissioned, or certainly involved in it. Uh, they were the people who brought Doctor Who back in 2005. And look what happened there. Now on a new worldwide platform, Disney Plus, sky's the limit. So... Let's see what happens. Fingers crossed, this could be good. This could be very, very good. Right, let's talk about the power of the Doctor then. And everybody and his dog has done a video by now, so I'm going to keep it fairly brief. I thought this was a terrific episode. For all sorts of reasons. Um, there were lots of things in here which fed into what Chris Chibnall has been doing over the last couple of years with Doctor Who. This was very much an episode for people who've been playing, paying close attention whether that is, as it turns out, right back to the beginning of Doctor Who or just across the last three years. It paid off lots of things. Um, the Return of the Master played absolutely brilliantly by Sasha Darwin, and please, we can't lose him. He has to carry on into the new era of Doctor Who because he's a phenomenon. And I mean that in a very real sense. Um, as a story, it was sort of crazy and it's, it had that sort of throw mud at the wall sort of thing we often have with Chris Chibnall. But I would rather that than the previous era of Doctor Who, which just kept retreading the same idea. Oh, look, it's misunderstood machine technology. Oh, look, it's an alien that means well. But, and there were a lot of things in the previous era that just went round and round and round. Chris Chibnall, for any and all of his faults, full of ideas. Not all of them worked, not a lot of them made sense. But they were there, and he tried them, and he came up with them, and he threw them at the screen. And this was one of those episodes... Um, just look at the plot elements in itself, you know, the first scene with the bullet train that's being attacked by Cybermen for something in its cargo. Then you've got the missing paintings. And I still don't quite understand what that was all about beyond the idea of the master taunting the doctor and the seismologists who've all gone missing for reasons that, that we established were to do with the master. Lots of stuff thrown at the screen there. You've got the cyber masters, the cyber... Yeah, the Cyber Masters from uh, season 12 finale, the regenerating Cybermen. We've got the Daleks who got their own plan to destroy the Earth and a rogue Dalek who wants to wipe out the Daleks. We've got the Doctor um, unknowingly heading towards her own demise. So it was, it was an 89 minute episode and it didn't pause really. It didn't really pause for breath. It just rattled along. I was struck by how visual and cinematic it looked you could imagine watching this and i really would love to see this on a big big screen and i'm going to watch it on my projector at some point and i can imagine it's going to look fantastic there but on a big screen this was a doctor who film to all intents and purposes it had the scale it had the storytelling chops it had the emotional moments and i'll come back to those in a moment because that's what i was particularly impressed by um it was great it had all the stuff that you expect in a chris chibnall doctor who story for better or for worse um I don't think you can criticise him for want of trying to do something with the show. And, you know, there's a there's books to be written about what Chris Chibnall did and didn't do, should have done and didn't do. But all in all, I think he made a good fist of trying to make Doctor Who um, exciting again, which I haven't been for some years, in my opinion. So, yeah, I think it was a fantastic and magnificent spectacle. Uh, but it lived and died for a lot of people, of course. And for me, as a fanboy by the callbacks, and there were so many callbacks in this episode. You didn't just have the return of Sophie Aldred as Ace and Janet Fielding as Tegan from the 80s. That in itself was a joy. And I was slightly not critical of it. I was thinking, well, they were characters that came along at the tail end of Doctor Who when it was slipping out of popularity. And whilst I'm not a massive fan of the 80s and Doctor Who because I could see it slipping away in the wake of Star Wars, I understand that there are a lot of people who Ace is like an important character to them. A Tegan is an important character to them. And it was nice to see them both back. They were great. 
Um, I think that their performances were very 1980s TV performances in a 2020 TV world. But I thought it was just nice to see them. They had a lot to do. I was a little bit worried that um, they might be a little more than cameo performances, but they were front and centre throughout most of the story, involved in the action, involved in really what was going on. I slightly puzzling, I saw somebody on Facebook who'd seen the episode before, uh, described it as a blink and you'll miss it appearance. Well, that's just clearly nonsense because they were in this pretty much all the way through. Um, then we had, of course, the callbacks to the previous Doctors. Again, that was something I thought, how can we bring those actors back when they look, let's face it, so much older than they did when they were in the show? I think it was done very, very cleverly by having their appearances as something in the Doctor's subconscious as she crosses over mid-regeneration. Really nicely done. It was fantastic to see um, Paul McGann, particularly, who's the great... Um, missed opportunity in Doctor Who. He he was terrific. Um, he he hasn't aged that much really since he did the episode back in nineteen ninety six. Um, he still looks quite young and vibrant. We had Sylvester McCoy, Colin Baker, Peter Davison, and David Bradley reprising his role as the first Doctor, which is sort of passed into Doctor Who canon now, I suppose. And I like David Bradley. I like the performance. It's not William Hartnell, um, but it was it was just magical really to see them there. And I'm a slightly cynical fanboy sometimes. I I like to see certain things from Doctor Who referenced um, but sometimes Rosie put your tail down oh, she's a monkey she's a cat but you know she behaves like a monkey anyway um, I'm very wary of too much Doctor Who lore being foisted on an audience that doesn't really understand it but I think this was such a big celebration of Doctor Who and the BBC of course it was screened as part of the 100th anniversary BBC celebrations um, and it was just great to see them again it just it's an episode that you watch and you pick up on lots of references or lots of references in the dialogue to things from Ace and Tegan's past and the Doctor's own past um, that just make you tingle a bit because it is canon, it is Doctor Who lore that we're all as Doctor Who fans familiar with, sometimes over familiar with. And it was just nice to see it referenced on a prime time BBC drama. Um, I loved it. I, I just loved all that sort of stuff. I just wallowed in it because uh, Doctor Who can do that sometimes. And I think what this episode was, as well as being Jodie Whittaker's finale and this celebration of the BBC, it was the best celebration of Doctor Who we've ever had. We had for the 10th anniversary, the three Doctors. We had the big five Doctors spectacle in 1983. And we had Stephen Moffat's Day of the Doctor in 2013. Uh, this, to me, is the biggest and best celebration of this is what Doctor Who is. I think Moffat, in retrospect, fudged Day of the Doctor quite badly. Five Doctors had certain limitations, and of course it was made in the 80s. Three Doctors was a bit more low-key, because Doctor Who was 10 years old, and while it was acknowledging its past, it wasn't reveling in it. This was Doctor Who saying, look at us, we've been here for nearly 60 years, and this is great. And it was great, it was great. And again, the scene at the end with the reunion, the, the support group of Doctor Who ex-companions, led by Bradley Walsh, was Graham, who of course returned in the episode as well. Um, it was just a lovely, lovely scene to see... Ian Chesterton, played by William Russell, who's 97 years old. And that was a really resonant moment because that suddenly makes you realise, wow, this episode is umbilically connected to the very first episode of Doctor Who in 1963. And I don't think I sort of appreciated it at the time. It actually really hit me on Monday. I thought, wow, we've just had a character, an actor, who was in Doctor Who when it began. And there's very few actors left from that era. Caroline Ford as Susan. She couldn't be in it for obvious reasons, if you know the history of Doctor Who. And you just think, whoa, this is just extraordinary that we've got this massive connection that stretches across the decades, stretches across the generations. Of course, we had Katie Manning as the adorable Joe Grant. And I didn't like Joe Grant at the time, but Katie Manning is a force of nature. Um, Bonnie Langford as Melanie Bush. A lot of fans might have been baffled to see Bonnie Langford there because she was at a time when Doctor Who was really on its uppers. But it was, it was just nice to see her there. Um, there were others that could have been there, but it was a nice symbolic thing. And I love the idea, and it's a very clever idea, really, that people who've travelled with the Doctor were very unique, special people. And when they come back to their lives, and not all Doctor Who's contemporary Earth companions do come back. Some of them are left on the way, some left in the future. One or two have died. Steady. Um, and I think it's a really nice idea to think that those people living their lives 
with this huge knowledge of what they've been through. And it's, I like the idea that there's a group of them that meet up and talk about what they've been through. It's a really nice idea. Uh, and then we have Jodie's regeneration, of course. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about Jodie Whittaker and Mandip Gill. And, in fact, all the companion characters. Dan, played by John Bishop, left early on in the episode. I was quite surprised. I thought he might crop up again a little bit sooner than he did. He did pop up at the end. And it was an interesting way to write that character. And it, it makes complete sense because he's just been in a perilous situation that made him realise how difficult and dangerous his life has become and that he doesn't want to take push his luck any further. I thought it was really nicely done. Very nicely done. He just suddenly decides, no, I can't take these chances anymore. I've got to get back to the real world and my real life. Really nicely done. And subverted expectations by happening within about the first 10, 15 minutes of the episode. Really nicely done. Very nicely performed. Very nicely written. This is what Chris Chibnall does do. I think he does these emotional, core emotional moments of the characters really well. I think he also did the moments where the Doctor meets Ace and Tegan again really well. That's that moment when... Kate Stewart played brilliantly by Gemma Redgrave particularly brilliant in this episode I thought she had much more range to her I think than we've seen before and the Doctor walks in and sees Ace and Tegan and in Jodie Whittaker's face you can see that look that stunned look of wow these are people I haven't seen for decades but the connection is there straight away you feel that connection um Mandip Gill, now she's got a lot of criticism in the past for being an underdeveloped character and a bit bland, and I think you can't argue with that. She was just somebody who trailed around after the Doctor. And we had them touching on this Thasmin thing in the last episode. It's been sort of hinted at, but that was resolved, and I think some fans expected there was going to be some big romantic declaration in this episode, but that was sort of dealt with in The Legend of the Sea Devils, where the Doctor sort of made it clear to Yaz that there was a love between them, but the Doctor can never really get involved in that sort of thing he's done it before and it hasn't worked out and he has to keep moving because he keeps changing she keeps changing and i think that wasn't going to be reopened in this episode but you could clearly see there was something not just between the doctor and yaz but the doctor uh jody whitaker and mandip gill who've spoken quite openly that they are now friends for life they've had such an experience making this show over these last four or five years uh, and I think that's what really came across, really struck me at last this episode. Wow, what a team these two have really been, because the actors are so close, and they've made the characters, for all Yaz's lack of character a lot of the time, uh, I think she came alive in this episode, and I really love that last scene where the Doctor's injured and started to regenerate, and they both know what's going to happen, and Yaz knows that a special time in their life is coming to an end. Um, and... Um, that wonderful, beautifully staged scene where they're on top of the TARDIS eating ice cream, looking at the earth. The writing is just completely on point. And as I say, that's what I think Chibnall's real strength was. When he was on form, he could write dialogue that sang in terms of these characters and the words that they used and the way they expressed them. The Doctor saying about, you know, looking back at the past and when the Doctor says to Yaz, I have to do this bit on my own and regenerates outside the TARDIS. Just... Beautiful, beautiful Doctor Who, beautiful television. And there will be people out there, the Not My Doctor crowd, who will be wailing and screaming and throwing insults. Get on with it, I don't care. Um, you're the ones who've missed out, frankly. And then, of course, we have the regeneration itself, where apparently a lot of people were surprised to see her regenerate into David Tennant. This part of the episode wasn't shown to critics at the preview screening, but we sort of knew it was coming because we knew David Tennant was coming back. But it was... An extraordinary moment to see that regeneration where her clothes burn off to be replaced by a semblance, a version of David Tennant's Doctor's costume. A lot of people have said, well, how come the clothes regenerated? I think that's going to figure in part of the specials next year uh, as to explain why we have this 14th Doctor who looks at the 10th. Uh, it's just great to see him again. And of course, that was written by Russell T. Davis, who did his wonderful callback to Tennant's first appearance with his comments about the teeth. And then, as I referenced in the previous video I did, the what, what, what thing, which was always one of his little trademarks leading into Christmas specials in the past. Um, so all in all, I had a thoroughly good time with this episode. I mean, yeah, it was ramshackle in places. It was all over the place. And it wasn't a, a nice, clear, straight, linear line. And there was lots of techno babble and bits and pseudoscience. But come on, does it really matter at the end of the day? 
Um, so probably not a classic Doctor Who story in itself. But as I said, in terms of celebrating Doctor Who, in terms of a Doctor leaving, I think it's the, probably the best regeneration sequence I've seen. I love David Tennant's regeneration. I thought that Christopher Eccleston's was very poignant. I'm going to say this is up there with the very best regeneration episodes and regeneration sequences. I thought it was a terrific episode. Um, I tried to balance my critical faculties with my fanboy tendencies. I think the fanboy tendencies probably won out in the end. And I don't want to nitpick this episode because you could do that, you could do it to anything. But at the end of the day, this was 90 minutes where you just revel in Doctor Who and you realise how bloody great Doctor Who is. It has its ups and downs, but at the end of the day, it's special. It's a special show. Um, so many of the things I've done in my life have happened because of my love of Doctor Who. People I've met, things I've been involved with, creative things I've done. The old trail back to Doctor Who and I will never, ever take that for granted. Um, so anyway, that's The Power of the Doctor, which I thought was just a terrific piece of entertainment. I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10 as a piece of extraordinary television with some great visual effects. Um, a love letter to Doctor Who and more importantly a love letter to its fans who I think a lot of the time don't deserve it. Right, thank you very much for watching. It's gone on a little bit longer than I anticipated. Apologies. Um, but there's a lot to say about the future of Doctor Who and there's a lot to say about this episode. Oh, and about Shuti Gatwa. Um, I've seen a couple of clips on YouTube lately and of course he appeared at the end of the Coming Soon trailer. Um, yeah, I, I, I like him. I mean, I... I kept my powder dry because I've not seen sex education I've not seen anything he's done but I've seen a couple of things there was um, an American TV thing where he revealed about the Disney Plus deal and a little Q&A about Doctor Who that he's done for the Doctor Who YouTube channel I think he's going to be good uh, I think he's going to bring something special to it I've just got a feeling he is going to really take the mantle and run with it or the baton and run with it or whatever so yeah, thumbs up for Shuti Gatwa Right, that is definitely it. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it hasn't um, tested your patience too much. But there was quite a bit to say. And then probably, as soon as I stop recording, I'll probably think, oh, I should have mentioned this, I should have mentioned that. Because there was so much in Power of the Doctor, you'll all have your favourite moments. And I do hope that you all just enjoyed it for what it was. The celebration of this extraordinary television series. Right, I am out of here now. Thank you for watching. Uh, like and subscribe if you've liked this. Uh, share it with other people. It will be cool too. And leave a comment, even better. Coming up next will be my review of the new horror film Barbarian, which opens in UK cinemas this weekend. And there'll be more bits and pieces coming along very, very soon. Until I see you, hey, keep checking the stuff. <laughs>